Hello and welcome to ORF's monthly national security conversation series. I'm Samir Patil. Today, we are going to discuss the changing nature of warfare. The Russia-Ukraine conflict has marked a new phase of interstate warfare or high-intensity warfare. From the deployment of advanced weapons like the vacuum bomb and Turkish Bayraktar drones to the usage of the hybrid warfare capabilities, this conflict may have set the template for future hostilities. How have these developments on the Ukrainian battlefield demonstrated the new phase of warfare? To discuss this important question, today we have with us Lieutenant General Raj Shukla. General Shukla is a retired army commander and has enabled official service and record spanning more than four decades. His most recent position was the commander of ARTRAC, or the Army Training Command based in Shukla. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you, Sami. Thanks a lot. Great to be with you. So let, so let me jump in straight away. Uh, what is the significance of the Ukraine conflict on the international system in general and on warfare? Okay, you know, so the first thing I want to say is that, you know, in my view, before we get to the military lessons, uh, Ukraine has been a watershed of many sorts. There are major, shall I say, seismic impl implications for the wider international system is also you know systemic consequences for national security and war fighting so very quickly you know what are the implications for the wider uh, international system well first and foremost uh, you know i think we see the returning salience of the instrument of force in the far calculus uh, for a long time we heard this refrain that the days of all out conflict are over Ladai nahi hone wali in India also was the talk. Uh, that doesn't seem to be true, or at least only partially true. You know, we saw violence in the global war on terror. We saw limited wars in Syria, Libya, Nagorno Karabakh. But this kind of conflict, you know, in 21st century Europe, uh, leading to violation of territorial integrity, where the survival of state is at stake, uh, this is a huge game changer. And just as a matter of interest, you know, I was at the Rusi Land Warfare Conference. This is a conference which is held in London annually in 2018. All the participants there, there were people from UK, from the defense establishment, from Europe. Everybody was of the view that, you know, Russia was in this very offensive posture. Now, they did not necessarily predict Ukraine. But they were all confident that we must return to great power competition and take into account Russia's military visage. So that was the view in 2018, near unanimous. Uh, the, it's a different matter that nothing was done about it. So uh, the first point uh, that we must really wonder is that when we saw it coming, or at least when Europe saw it coming, why it did not do you know, enough. The second lesson you see is I think there is now an unfolding Cold War. And in this new Cold War between, you know, America led West and China and Russia on one side, Ukraine may just be chapter one. Chapter two could be Taiwan. Chapter three could be something along the LAC. That's the second point. And the third point is really this breakdown that we see in the nuclear settlement. You know, we've had nuclear stability since World War II. There has been saber rattling. Even in Afghanistan, it's a matter of uh, interest when two major superpowers had to move out in humiliating withdrawal. They never threatened the use of nuclear weapons. But here you have Putin, you know, doing this exercise on nuclear readiness, saber rattling. And it is now widely held view that if for some reason, though it doesn't seem likely now, Russia gets defeated in Ukraine, the use of tactical nuclear weapons is very much a possibility. So this is another thing we have to revisit the nuclear paradigm, especially in the light of, you know, what the Chinese have done with the FOBS, so on and so forth. And the last point is that the war points to the limitations of economic statecraft. I mean, despite all the energy dependencies, here you have a war between Russia and the rest of Europe. So the surest deterrent seems to be a joint calibrated, technologically enabled and ready instrument of force. Very important in the Indian context, because each of these one word descriptors 
takes a decade to create. You know, the problems in jointness, it takes two decades to get joint, two decades to get technologically enabled, ready. Russia, um, I mean, was hailed by many as this great 21st century military. It proved at least in phase one to be thoroughly unready. So these are the lessons that we must draw from Ukraine, both from the you know, implications on the wider international system as also uh, for national security. Sir, one of the other things that uh, we have also seen is the use of the hybrid warfare capabilities by Russia. We first saw in Crimea and now in Ukraine. Uh, how have these uh, tactics really helped Russia to advance its strategic goals? So, you know, um, this is also interesting. As long as Putin was not fighting, he seemed to be winning. When he began fighting, that the losses came to the fore. So we saw, you know, Georgia, then Crimea, then uh, Chechnya, though it was internal, and limited wars in Syria. You saw these little green men where there was non-attributability. We saw how the information warfare dynamic was smartly leveraged. So as long as he kept the conflict below the threshold of all out violence, he did seem to be winning. So it does prove that, you know, two deductions quickly that somebody has used the phrase that militaries need to develop parallel competencies in competition and conflict. And competition is very different from conflict. For example, China has altered the entire dynamic in the South China Sea without even firing a shot the geostrategic reality without even firing a shot. That does not necessarily prove that China will do equally well in a military confrontation with Taiwan because they are two different sets of competencies and they are a huge ask. While it is easy for the politician to swivel from grey zone to all out conflict as Putin did and possibly on military advice, he was told that, you know, these seven trust lines into Ukraine will overwhelm them. But that wasn't the case. So that is one point you have to be very careful when you when you think of grey zone and all out uh, uh, conflict. And the other thing I think you alluded to this in your introduction is that industrial warfare is not over. Many of us thought that we have seen the last of industrial age warfare. Uh, it's Russia has proven that it is not over. But we do see elements of the digital age coming in. So while you need industrial era capacities, it is your uh, ability to juggle with both competencies in, in industrial era warfare as also the di digital age, which will be the hallmark of true militaries. So just let me give you an example. Industrial era capacities, at least in phase two of the conflict in Donbass and around it, what has been the game changer is, is massed artillery, which is actually an industrial era instrument. You've seen these Russians amass artillery, you know, in numbers, they exceed Ukrainian artillery 10 times, firing 50,000 right rounds a day and literally bombarding the combat positions in cities out of existence and edging forward. And now it is pretty apparent that uh, unless the Ukrainians are given long range precision fires, uh, the military balance will uh, remain in the Russians favor. Digital era was equally important. See what the Starlink terminals did. Um, it is essentially a digital era instrument. It was used for strategic communications. It was used for target designation. It was used for protecting Ukrainian command and control. Uh, similarly, if you see the US uh, cyber command, I'm told for four years, they were deploying these forward hunting teams in concert with the Ukrainians, Microsoft created these threat response centers, which ensured remarkable success in jamming of the Russian UAVs. That answers the question that why didn't uh, these formidable capacities of Russia in cyber and electronic warfare uh, really succeed? They didn't succeed because the response was, uh, shall I say, diligent and uh, very dodged. So you see, you have to have competencies in both industrial era competencies and digital era comp competencies. That seems to be another lesson, hybridity in that form and hybridity in the form of 
parallel competencies in competition and conflict. So looking at that uh, latter aspect, uh, which kind of technologies, disruptive technologies, do you think will matter the most uh, looking at the future course of warfare uh, for the militaries? So you see, even when you use industrial era platforms, for example, the tank and or what we call, uh, shall we say, capital in intensive platforms, the tank and the Su-30 and the Moskva, if they are not updated or upgraded in terms of digital era proficiencies, they will perform suboptimally. Or another way, perhaps, of putting it is that uh, 20th century platforms will not survive easily in the 21st century battle. And so therefore, if you see how, shall I say, small, innovative, small but innovative embedded technologies have begun to challenge legacy platforms. So what the tank, the Javelin top attack armor did to the tank, what the drones did to the tanks. You had these, you know, Puma switchblade combinations. Puma for designation, switchblade, loiter coming in and taking out five to six tanks at one go. What the Stinger did to the Su-30 or actually what layered AD has done to aerial platforms. So uh, portable AD systems, um, man pads, uh, S300, S400s, multi-layered. They have literally prevented uh, this very formidable Russian air power from operating with any ease in Ukrainian airspace. Ukraine airspace is still contested territory. And now in phase two, you have this very interesting uh, development where the Barakta drones are being targeted by an equally uh, robust Russian AD system. And in military circles over the last three to four, five years, people said, uh, you know, ground ADs cannot survive uh, the overwhelming power of air power. That hasn't proved to be true. See what the Moskva, I mean, how it was taken out by the Neptune missile. So it raises these whole questions about the survivability of aircraft carriers, so on and so forth. Look at the grave losses that Russia has suffered. Over 1,000 tanks, I'm told 50 helicopters, close to 400 artillery pieces and some 40 to 50 fixed wing aircraft, which are great losses and all at the mercy of small and emerging technologies. Swarming does seem to be challenging tank surging. You know, for long, militaries prided themselves in fire and maneuver. Now with space-based assets and precisionary, precisionary also has been game-changing. Surveillance and precisionary are challenging fire and maneuver. Microelectronics, you know, the small chip, it's used in RF, it's used in radar, it's used in imaging, it's used in communications. In fact, Russian weaknesses in microelectronics have uh, been a big reason why this grand Russian military has performed suboptimally, at least in phase one. Uh, so I think the future is about these small innovative technologies, deep technologies, AI. I mean, if you're going to have platforms which think and act faster than thought, uh, I mean, a Mach 7 missile cannot be responded to at the level of, uh, at the rate of human judgment. It has to be responded to at the rate of machine learning. So you have to reinforce your, you know, these uh, capital platforms with technological innovation and invest greatly into deep technologies of the future. So that is the challenge for militaries and that is the challenge, I think, in the national security spectrum. Uh, so certainly some of the militaries are looking at the developments of the Ukrainian battlefield to uh, imbibe lessons uh, for, their, for, for, for themselves. Uh, you know, what kind of lessons do you think are important from this conflict for the global militaries? See, there are some general lessons which will apply to militaries across the board and then there'll be some lessons i think which are pertinent to india so just look at some general lessons one is this i mean we all uh, i mean in international relations the salience of a calibrated instrument of force not an instrument of force to jackboot around the world but with precise calibrated technologically enabled uh, you know like, capacities, that is the surest form of deterrent. I think it was uh, Chanakya who said uh, very aptly, he said, if you forget your shastra, then you will forget your shastra. If you forget your shastra, then you will forget your shastra. That is a lesson I don't think we should forget. 
uh, George Schultz. I mean, let, let me labor in it because I am really have a deep conviction about this. George Schultz said that negotiations are but a euphemism for capitulation unless you have the shadow of power cast across the bargaining table. So the salience of instrument of force is one of the big lessons for global militaries. Um, because the last place you thought you'll have all-out conflict was Europe, modern, prosperous Europe, see what's happened. And this great challenge of, you know, not confusing competencies in competition with those in conflict. Uh, you know, gray zone and all-out conflict. To make that transition is not easy. And India faces a similar problem or a similar challenge. You have the gray zone paradigm unfolding along the LAC. You will have it in the IOR. But all-out conflict is a very different ballgame, as Russia has shown. So these are, you know, uh, the two large lessons. The, uh, you know, uh, the other issues are, you know, industrial era capacities. Now you suddenly discover here that the Americans are unable in their current industrial base to keep up with the need for javelin missiles. I'm told about five to six hundred are being fired for a day. And the numbers needed, the Americans are not able to supply them. The demand for Leopard, two tanks, high Mars, industrial capacities need to keep pace uh, because in protracted conflicts, they will be the battle winning factor. The next issue is, you know, supply chain independence. It is key to strategic autonomy and your military uh, deliverance. Look at the Russians. I'm told I picked this out from somewhere in cruise missiles with the Iskander ballistic missile system, the Tornado rocket launcher system, the Tor N280 systems. You know, for small issues like fiber optics, oscillators, socket attachments, they are dependent on the USA and the UK, the Russians. And they are handicapped in, uh, you know, now refurbishing or repairing these systems. When they are falling short of tanks, Two major Russian manufacturers simply don't have the spares. So supply chain independence is another factor, you know, for global militaries. And the last point I'd like to make is that Russia is merely a bump along the national security path. The greater challenge if push comes to shove is this transition that you have to make from industrial era capacities to digital age capacities, because that is where the Chinese are doing a great deal. So in AI, autonomous systems, um, digital combat, AI enabled warfare, it will need an entirely different thrust. Uh, so, you know, Russia is a good wake up call, but we have to see each military has to see um, what uh, or who its adversary is and brace up accordingly. So I think those are the challenges for uh, for global militaries. Uh, so you applied to the, uh, the uh, you alluded to the Indian uh, context, and we have also initiated our own set of military reforms, uh, jointness, theatrization, uh, the, the creation of the post of chief of defense staff. Uh, how will some of these lessons apply in the Indian context? Yes, yeah, so you see, India also is doing a great deal, as you pointed out, the CDS DMA was a game changer. But you know, the principal issue of CDS DMA is what the CDS DMA was created to drive change through the national security system. And that is going to be a huge challenge, as you've seen with the Agni Veer, because it is a big, bold, transformative reform in HR, and there will be pushbacks and apprehensions of that sort. And, you know, Atmanirabharata, once again, it's not just a slogan of self-reliance. It is about technological innovation, technological innovation by getting all competencies together. So. You know, these things have been initiated by this government. You see defense coming out of the shadows of foreign policy. But when defense comes out of the shadows of foreign policy and when you adopt a muscular outlook, you also have to ensure that your instruments are ready. So all these, uh, you know, things um, are challenges. Look at the salience of theater commands. The Russians had these seven massive offensives north to south, all under a military district. And they didn't seem to deliver at all. They lacked in coordination and convergence. And you now have a theater commander appointed in Russia. So now in the context of our own, uh, you know, theater commands, it's so important. So theater commands, uh, 
we have a large number of these soviet era platforms both in the army navy as also in the air force so we do have to see how we need to right size our relationships diversify our weapon inventories look at the supply chain dependencies that i talked of because the future is unpredictable while you know we have great regard and uh, for the our relationship with russia but uh, we do have to take all this into account and also the soviet era platforms in my view will have to be upgraded massively in terms of technological innovation so you need a whole blitzkrieg here upgrading these the platforms in terms of isr precisionary you see look at our tanks so we have to upgrade them in terms of counter drone systems in terms of active protection systems few sensors our artillery ammunition is dumb and the future seems to be about long range precision it has to be precise long range precision uh huge investments in isr look at the leo terminals of uh, leon musk they did great stuff uh, on the tactical battlefield so we need a similar leo configuration perhaps in ladakh uh given i spoke about you know this multi layered ad so i'm sure these things are happening all the time I'm saying much of it will be happening but perhaps a more pointed look the iaf has to audit its its ability to penetrate the a to ad umbrella of the chinese in the western theater i'm sure they'll be doing it but you need upgrades we also need to see in our budgets how we prioritize these emerging technologies over legacy platforms you know just not just 100 more artillery pieces but perhaps 50 artillery pieces with 50 50 uh, or in uh, shall we say value terms precision munition which is of same value as those 50 artillery pieces we'll have to fuse uh, develop this you know whole ecosystem of technological innovation and therefore the startups atmanirbharta they really need to succeed two three more lessons very quickly one is orchestration of large scale formations in our context especially along the western borders it is of great salience uh, orchestrating these large formations is going to be a challenge developing multi domain competencies you know your ability to fuse space cyber ew with the traditional domains um, these are huge challenges training i mean the russian the fact that the ukrainians have done better than the russians at least in phase 1 points to the great uh, emphasis on training of the ukrainians by the west and a lack thereof in the russians logistics if you see phase 1 and phase 2 of the operations in ukraine phase 1 did not do so well because the logistics infra failed to keep pace with the combat push after all the leading elements of russian armor were at kiev in 48 hours logistics didn't keep pace why they are doing better in donbas because they have secure lines of communication so on and so forth i'll give you one last example you see you see these huge trains of the russians you saw those convoys it was because of these large combat signatures were because their power management systems were unwieldy so one ad gun six vehicles worth of generators so if you invest in these power management systems miniaturize them your combat signatures reduce then new talent pipelines new age warfare needs new talent pipelines so salience of agnivir asymmetric deterrence within the same budget by carrying out structural technological reforms how you can deliver better combat outcomes what the ukrainians have done with the russians so these are all the lessons i think from ukraine uh, which apply to the uh, the indian military did uh, sir one absolute last question and because you mentioned agnivir and this entire scheme of military equipment mm. uh, one thing that we did not discuss is the role of private military groups such as the wagner group uh, for instance uh do you see that you know that this changing this change tactic of warfare will have a prominent role for the private uh, recruits or the private military companies you see if you are talking of private sector in capacity building and war fighting that yes that seems to be the future look at what see elon musk has done you go back to our days space was a country thing an exclusive club of countries he has made it a company thing he is launching satellites for the us air force he's talking of uh, these anti anti satellite systems 
developing them for the U.S. Uh, Air Force and the U.S. Space Command. Today, the partner with U.S. Space Com is not NASA, it's not Lockheed, it's Elon Musk. So the private sector, because it brings these capacities of you know, innovation, energy, enterprise, risk taking. So private sector, both in war fighting and in capacity building. The sole Atm Indian Atmanir Bharata is what? It is a very strong push to get startups, entrepreneurs, technologists, dreamers, DRDO, military, everybody in this game together because national security is so complex today and so sophisticated that no single institution can do it. So private sector in this sense is an, is, is an absolute imperative. The Wagner business that you're talking about, you know, contractors in war fighting, that's not quite the Indian policy. That's what the Russians do and all in, in proxy fights. So I won't say Wagner's, you know, for war fighting, those uh, contractors of those kind. But using the private sector to develop competencies in capacity building and war fighting, that's a very distinct uh, field. And there, uh, um, we are already doing it. Um, it's, it's a matter of how smartly we accelerate. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Janet Shukra, for taking out time from your busy schedule uh, to join us to discuss this changing nature of warfare. I really appreciate it. This discussion has been really engrossing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Great pleasure, Sumit. Thanks a lot.